formative experiences with mentor tax. So I gave you a, a huge variety of mentor tax that are in front of you, a slice of life. And the first time that we tried slice of life in our classroom, um, I, I think I read every one of these books to my kids. Um, and then um, we started our slice of life study and they wrote and it was really challenging because you can see how depending on what your topic is and depending on where you want to go, you read different, it's going to look very different. So it was a, a pretty challenging time. So, but they were successful, but remember, I'm trying to get kids to be independent learners, and I had to be really shoulder to shoulder with them doing that. So I, the next time around that we tried it, my little friend that had the little pumpkin book at the beginning, the um, um, Felicia Bond um, illustrator, this illustrator, she said to me as I was writing, I was starting to write a second slice of life um, because I model writing in my class and on my own. She said, Mrs. Cornett, do you remember those, those slice of life stories that we were reading about the seasons? Those, those would be a perfect example for us to maybe try. And so that's what we did. That's what we shared in some things. We added Karen as a viewer, not an editor, because otherwise she can see everything that we, we kind of hashed out. And that's it. So I will post this sample letter. This is one that I personally wrote. There's another one posted on the uh, response group site that somebody else wrote. I can't remember who it was. Nick, I brought my portfolio in, and my portfolio has So you're going to see Bill and I and Karen write the first one. I'm going to take Cassie's group with my group so we can talk this out together. That will be the first sample. And then from there, then on, somebody in my group will be responsible for writing the letter to Bill and I, maybe the next time that we just kind of rotate it around. Again, think about, think about, and it's not that you won't get help from other people. You'll, you'll get the help and insight from all your group. If I should have a daughter, I will teach her to push beyond the boundaries, the walls laid by society. She will demolish those bricks one by one with her incisive eyes. She'll know how to question herself without losing faith in her actions and intentions. Her tiny hands will change the world as she questions everything, because she'll know that rules are merely guidelines. Her repartee will strike down her foes, but she will always be there to help them up with a forgiving hand. In her eyes, her wide eyes, the world will be reimagined, reconfigured, reconstructed, so that the pieces start to make sense. After all, the world will be her puzzle, a map of interconnectedness that displays the patterns of living. She will know that no one can be right all the time, but will learn to trust nonetheless. Her curiosity will know no bounds. Exposing the man behind the green curtain will be as natural to her as breathing. She will love and fight and dream and will never, never apologize for reacting to the world with tears or anger because sometimes it can all be too much to handle with grace. She will live life with regrets because you have not truly lived or loved or learned until you've tried and failed. She will always know she is loved and will always know how to love both herself and others. Um, I grew up in a hard-working GM town where everyone loved and worked on cars. 
in my former years, my father was a self-employed auto mechanic who had repaired and improved rifles in Europe during World War II. My mother was a stay-at-home mom who had been chief payroll secretary at the Grand Blank Tank Plant during the war. However, they dreamed of something more for their children, a college education, something neither of them had achieved. So inquiry, intellect, and education were valued above all else. On my father's meager income, they worked to provide us with uh, many rich experiences despite my mother's chronic illness. Museums, libraries, and trips to historic places filled my world. I remain, I remain fascinated by how things were invented, created, and produced. More importantly, I was um, fascinated with how these amazing people overcame many hardships to become leaders in their fields. At the time, I didn't realize that their stories would help me persevere through my mother's early death and my father's subsequent marriage to a woman who did not value these ideals. Wow. The water had knocked the computer off the console it was balancing on, and both water and laptop rested on the passenger seat in juxtaposition more perfect than he had seen in any painting. Steam gathered in his head, hoping to come out his ears. His face was now the color of the ink of his high, that his high school English teacher used on his papers. <laughs> he grabbed his new piece of trash that had once been his laptop and in one sweeping motion hurled it high into the air. He made a loud, guttural sound accompanying this action, but there is no description for it other than unsettling. As Paul's throwing motion whirled him around, he saw it. A police cruiser, noticing the disabled vehicle on the side of the road, was slowing to a stop, presumably to help. <clears throat> the computer was spinning at the apex of its flight, <clears throat> reminiscent of those bones in the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, its descent inevitable. Paul saw what was going to happen be long before it did, which seemed to slow time, given the effect of a computer falling as slowly as a stone on the moon. Once the loud, tinkling crash happened, time sped way up. He now saw the cop's surprised countenance replaced quickly with one of disgust as they both viewed the laptop in its resting place, a T-bone-like entry into the police windshield with one corner sticking through to the inside of the cruiser, the rest sticking straight up, perpendicular to the windshield it had destroyed. He hadn't been in jail before. It was not unlike what he saw of it on TV or in the movies. He had initially been placed in a holding cell made of thick plexiglass, but was now in a more typical cell with bars and cinder block walls. The bench was open, so he sat there. The voice startled him, and when he looked, he had to squint to see the person sitting in the dark shadow of the corner. Let me guess, drunk driving, the man said. Paul replied with a stutter, uh, well, no, malicious destruction of property on a cop car. The other prisoner smiled and said, I can respect that. I've wanted to do that for ages, but I never had the balls. It's pretty ballsy, man. Paul decided not to explain, since his offense had gotten him some street cred. But before long, others came. There was a man in for theft and another for assault. The assault guy wasn't in a good mood. Apparently, he didn't blow off enough steam in his fight that got him jailed. Paul made the mistake of getting caught looking at him. What the hell are you looking at, man? He threatened. Nothing, was Paul's unfortunate reply. Then the man menacingly asked, You calling me nothing? Paul tried to explain himself, but speaking of how seeing a jail is from television, this man apparently felt the need to assert his dominance over the cell, and after one punch in the eye and the nose, the man's fist was quite large, Paul meekly stayed in the opposite corner, packed up in an upright sitting fetal position, and made neither move nor sound. I'll just stop there. <laughs> a wonderful woman of incredible courage and internal beauty. What shall I do without your warm embrace of greeting each Sunday morning? <coughs> You've been so encouraging to me as I struggled to raise my children alone and without my mother to guide me. You were my cheerleader when you told me how polite they all were and how beautiful they were becoming as successful young women of faith. You were my inspiration as you told me your experiences growing up as a light-skinned girl. Kenley will appreciate your, ta your tales. You were also my historian as you described life in Black Bottom and the urban removal project that cut I-75 into your neighborhood. O seeker of faith, 
teller of tales, and wondrous counselor, you'll be missed in this life, never forgotten. God speed your way to eternal rest and give my love to Bogdan. Missing you already, Jan. Bogdan was my husband. Uh -huh.